Well, hi there. Welcome to the BDR Net Video channel. If you would, click on the little subscribe button below. And if you click on the little bell thing, it will let you know when new videos are posted. Thanks. Steve Wilde is back with us. I am so pleased. He's going to go to Nintendo Matching 102. Yeah. We have 101 already on the site that if you want to review it. And uh, here we'll learn some more things and probably find some things that we didn't know and now we're glad to know. Steve, the floor is yours. Okay, awesome. We're going to be reviewing what I displayed or, or showed last time. We'll peruse that, cover that, and then uh, what we'll do um, is discuss how do we take the network analyzer and uh, determine what the impedance phase angle is at the input of the antenna. So we can take a measurement and we, the goal is to, in this case, slug tune, um, know where to put the slug to uh, correct the mismatch of the circuit. And so starting the slideshow, uh, it's American Amplifier Technologies. And we have Three locations, Sacramento, Boise, and, Fe and Phoenix. And I'm working out of the Phoenix location today. We design RF products. Check out our website. Uh, you can see all the different products that we have available. Again, three locations. And um, I, we uh, at AAT and other manufacturers, um, we all have different ways or in, in many cases, the same way of fine matching using a slug. At American Amplifier Technologies, we use a steatite slug. ERI uses a steatite slug. Uh, some of the other manufacturers um, will use aluminum or brass slug and solder it in place or clamp it in place. They're doing um, more or less the same thing. They're, it's a reactive portion in the transmission line, in this case, at the input matching section of the antenna, and it's changing the impedance of the line at that location to correct the mismatch of the antenna, the slight mismatch, typically. And sometimes we can put a, a large slug to do a, a, a course adjustment, but we're talking about um, just doing a, a fine matching, usually a VSWR 1.5 to 1, um, or better, uh, somewhere in between a perfect match and 1.5 to 1, we, we use a fine matching network to correct that. So we're improving the VSWR of the transmission line. We're improving the performance of the antenna system. We can reduce some multipath. We can reduce AM noise um, and improves the uh, overall operations of the uh, transmission system, especially for winter environments, if we're already at a poor match and then we get ice or snow on the antenna and then it becomes worse. Um, so several important uh, factors for doing the fine matching once the antenna is installed. Uh, review on impedance and we could, we could, we could do this process uh, numerous different ways. I'm just describing one way, uh, one method, and I use a handful and um, I'm biased or I, you know, I feel comfortable doing it one way. Um, other engineers may want to work in admittance. Um, you know, I typically work in impedance and I like polar. Uh, that's how I visualize it. That's how I think about it. But you could do it so many different ways. So I'm, uh, I'm just talking about one way or maybe two or three. Again, it adds reactance to the transmission system at the input of the antenna. Uh, we're using a steatite slug, uh, larger transformer, the larger the reactance. And this is the, oh, something we've all seen before, the impedance chart, the Smith chart. Um, and I have a handful of these always around the office um, to, to take notes or plot. A lot of times I'll put this into bring this into a CAD drawing and actually plot it um, in CAD using lines and circles to quickly uh, plot um, the characteristic. 
So if we, again, if we had a, a perfect transmission line and uh, maybe just a small piece on our, on our test setup with a VNA, a vector network analyzer, and we calibrated that, that line section and it was a perfect match. It's dead center or working impedance of 50 ohms, zero J. And we put that, put a slug in it, it would go straight down at the measurement point. If we put the slug exactly at our measurement point, it would go straight down. Um, so if we're wanting to correct, let's see if the next slide shows that. If we're wanting to correct, we're going to be at positive 90 degrees. Um, we're going to be up here. We want the slug to correct to go towards our working impedance. So this is the VSWR circle. Um, sometimes to describe its uh, magnitude, as the circle gets larger, the magnitude is larger. So if the circle was all the way at the end of the chart, and this is a zoomed in chart, but if it was all the way at the end of a typical impedance chart, that would be an open or short. Um, that would be maximum magnitude. And minimum magnitude would be a perfect match. So if this BSWR circle plotted is 1.16 to 1. Um, the, we could call it the marker or the point um, at zero degrees, the circle here. And uh, today we're going to be using 98 one megahertz. So to calculate the movement, um, we're going to take, and I made an error uh, in the last presentation, someone caught it. So if, if, uh, if everyone could be double checking me, that'd be awesome. I, uh, I again wrote this, this, uh, this one pretty quickly this morning. So any errors that anyone sees, I would greatly appreciate you pointing it out. But we would take one rotation around the impedance chart is a half wave, 0.5 lambda. So if we take 0.5, divide it by 360, we get a lambda per degree measurement, which is 0 0.00138. Um, the, that's the degree, degree movement. Um, uh, the uh, <laughs> it's the lambda per degree, so degree movement times zero point zero zero one three eight eight. That number times ninety degrees would be zero point one two four nine, or we we can call it a a, a uh, quarter rotation. Point one two four nine or point one two five if we're rounding up. So then we take 1170, 1170, 11760 divided by the frequency, and that's going to be full wave and lambda in inches. We take um, that number, lambda, 119.877 times 0 0.1249 equals. 14.97 inches, 14.97 inches. And that would be that much movement from zero degrees to 90 degrees. Um, if we were measuring at the input of the antenna, um, if that was our measurement point at zero degrees, we would want the slug location to be at 90 degrees. Um, and that's a very simple review. We usually, when we take the measurement, we don't end up at zero degrees. Um, we're, we're some other um, measurement. And if we're taking the network analyzer or measuring at the input of the coax, you're measuring the degree angle at your termination point of the instrument. We want to know what the degree angle is at the input of the antenna. So there's a, there's a few ways of doing it. It's one little trick I like to do with the network analyzer because typically, um, a lot of times we're only tuning for one frequency. There's many multi-channel antenna systems and it gets more complex. I wanted to review multi-channel in another presentation, but today to tackle how do we um, determine what the degree angle is at the input of the antenna, because that's what we want to tell the tower crew. We want them to open up the matching section and we got to tell them where to put the slug at. So we need the degree angle at the input of the antenna system. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. So we've taken our network analyzer, we're at the transmitter site, and we're plugged up to the input of the coax. 
one of the first things that we could do is just take a measurement, make sure the antenna is functional. Ensure the antenna is functional. We have a VSWR 1.5 to 1 or better. Typically, we're getting 1.3 to 1, 1.2 to 1 or better. Um, but most specs are 1.5 to 1 or better on an FM antenna. So tower crew opens up the end of the coax. Um, with the VNA, we measure the open circuit. And this uh, image here is an illustration of an open circuit. You would have a, um, a, a high magnitude and it would maybe have several rotations. On this open, we just used a uh, approximately a 20 foot piece of coax um, and we took the open measurement. And we noted what the degree angle of the open measurement is. And so we can see that the marker at 98.1 is at negative 91.64. And this instrument, the Copper Mountain, um, they, uh, several instruments um, do it differently, but I've noticed that HP and uh, Agilent's key sites, roadies, uh, when you use the phase offset feature, you'll put in the exact number. With the Copper Mountain, you uh, put in what you want your correction to be, not the exact uh, degree angle. So in this case, uh, the measurement's negative 91.64, and on the Copper Mountain instrument, um, other instruments may vary, and most do actually, um, we would enter 91.64 in the phase offset. So what the phase offset does is if you were, um, it's used a lot of times if you have a test uh, adapter and you're measuring a circuit and after your calibration, you have a little bit of phase error, you can put in that correction and it will move your marker to zero degrees. Um, so then it's perfectly calibrated um, in impedance and in, in phase. Uh, with that phase offset feature. You can also use it for antenna tuning. And so I use it a lot of times if I'm on site and I'm doing just a single station tune or if I'm walking uh, one of the technicians through a single station tune, we'll just uh, use this feature to quickly put the phase offset in for the frequency that we're measuring. And so now measuring the open circuit, the tower crew has taken it the coax from the input of the antenna, and we're just measuring an open circuit. And we get negative 91.64, and we're using the Copper Mountain instrument today. So I'm going to put, I'm going to go to the phase offset feature, and I can show that after our, we get through the presentation, the PowerPoint, I can show that on the instrument where to find that, but um, in the phase offset feature, we're going to put 91.64. And so before the tower crew plugs up the uh, coax to the input of the antenna, I'm gonna make sure that my measurement goes back to uh, using my open data right there on the instrument. I, I wanna make sure my marker is at zero degrees and you can see it's really, really close. It's, uh, the, you know, I, could, I can increase the resolution of the, the data entry, to, but um, the degree angle is 0 0.0024, which in this case, and especially FM, <laughs> very good, <laughs> good for what we do. Um, so now I've corrected uh, the phase angle using the phase offset feature. So now when the tower crew plugs up the coax to the input of the antenna, now I'm measuring the actual uh, impedance phase angle at the input of the antenna. It's a nice little cheat using the um, network analyzer. So now um, the tower crew plugs up and this is just an antenna file that I grabbed. Um, it, they plug it back up. I put in this data and so now I know at the input of the antenna I'm measuring 52.87 degrees. So now I need to move the uh, I need, I need to move up, I need to rotate up to 90 degrees. And so that is going to be counterclockwise. And if we go up towards the antenna, that's gonna rotate counterclockwise. So I need to go up 
one, three degrees to get to nine degrees. So now I know that my movement is 37.13 degrees. So I'm gonna take my uh, lambda per degree, 0 0.001388 times 37.13, and that's gonna equal 0 0.0515 lambda movement. So that's how much lambda movement uh, I'm going to be going. So then we take uh, 1176, 11760 divide by the frequency, in this case 981, and that's going to equal 119.877 inches. That multiply times lambda or lambda movement equals 6.17 inches. So now I know I can tell the tower crew to we're going to measure from our termination of the input of the antenna up 6.17 inches, and that's where our slug's going to go. Now we need to know the magnitude of the, the uh, slugs, but there's a chart to go by and we can pick the right slug. Uh, but that in uh, all simplicity, it's, it's just, uh, you know, putting in your phase offset, measuring the uh, circuit after you put in your phase offset, determining what you need to do to get to 90 degrees, running a few calcs, and now you know where the slug needs to go. Um, you do need to know um, your magnitude, each slug amount, how much slug amount to use. Um, and typically on a steatite using 98.1, uh, a quarter inch slug is going to be 1.05. VSWR correction, um, and there's four slugs, um, a quarter inch, three eighths, half inch, and one inch. And you can stack those all together to get different magnitudes, but that's it. That's how to calculate um, using a VNA at the, in the transmitter building with your coax to determine where to put the slug in the input matching section of an antenna. And that's that's it for the presentation. Any any more questions or uh, thoughts on this? I have a question, Bert here. Uh, yeah. Just to, just to clarify, your first step then is to calibrate to the end of the coax, where it would hook onto the antenna, and then do your measurements of the antenna <clears throat> from the end of the coax as your extension cable, so to speak. Um, so actually, no, I don't, I don't, I, I, you would calibrate using your test cable inside the building. You'd, you'd have your, uh, cal kit and you would calibrate using your, your, uh, your test cable and your cal kit all inside the building. And you could, that would be another way of doing it. You could calibrate, you could send the cal kit up with the tower crew and they could calibrate for you. And, uh, but you're going to have some reducers in there, right? So if you calibrate using the reducers up on the tower, you'd have to maybe redo your open uh, circuit and then put a phase offset. That would be one way you could do it, but typically I'll calibrate the instrument inside and then include the coax in my measurement. I, okay, I would that, that, makes, that makes more sense to me. Do you recommend when you're doing your calibration rather than reducers to use flat plate adapters rather than tapered adapters? Um, it depends on um, the frequency. Say FM broadcast. And if it's a if it's a reducer that is has a, a decent match, most of the reducers we can get either if it's state if it's a step reducer or a tap tapered reducer or, or a plate reducer, especially in the FM band, usually those have pretty good characteristics. You know, some people may find that hey, I like a plate reducer. I I want to not add any uh, more length than I have to. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a plate reducer to keep that uh, length there uh, in check. Um, that makes sense, I can understand that. But me personally, I'll use any of them. And I, I don't, as long as it has a good characteristics, it, it's a well-manufactured reducer that um, doesn't add a gross uh, mismatch into the calibration. 
then I'm fine with it. Um, but if you say you did, say you, you used a, a step reducer or a tape reducer or a plate reducer that just had a, a 1.08 VSWR, and now you calibrated your, your instrument to that, um, now you could be tuning your near antenna to a 1.12 or, you know, whatever your error was, you could, you could be outside of, of a perfect match of, of an error up to 1.08 to 1, if that makes sense. I don't know if it does. Sense. It does make sense. Hey, Steve, this is Steve Marine. Hey, hey, Steve. Hi, how are you doing? I just wanted, maybe it's obvious, but if, if the initial uh, uh, phase angle that you need to correct is more than 90 degrees, but you wind up uh, just uh, having then to rotate it around. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so let me uh, let's see. I get out of this and have an, the instrument brought up here. So what if um, let me just walk it around a little bit? Can everyone see this on the screen? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll just put in some random numbers here. Let's see. Oh, dude. Good. So what if our measurement's over here? Uh, now what do we do, right? That's a great question. Um, so what you'd want to do is you, you, would, you can only go up, right? If, well, you, you could go down if, you're, if you have rigid transmission line below your measurement point. Um, and that's that's going to be uh, another presentation. How to how to how to slug tune with multiple frequencies, and put multiple slugs in the transmission system. Which get, that's when it gets a lot of fun. Um, so if you take a measurement and you're on the other side of ninety degrees, so in this case we're one hundred and eleven degrees positive, and you need to go up, you would. Um, what I like to do is to determine what the total degree measurement is all the way around because we're going to go clock counterclockwise to get to positive 90. So on the calculator here, what I like to do um, <clears throat> is, uh, let's see, 111 minus 90 is 21 degrees from 360. So 360 minus 21. So I'm going to go 300 and 39 degrees to get to my 90 degree point. Does that, does that make sense? Isn't it uh, 180 degrees around, not uh, 360? Well, well, it's 360 degrees total um, okay. All right. in, in degrees. Uh, if, we're, if we're doing a half a rotation, it would be 180. But on this chart, it is uh, an impedance chart. One full rotation is 360 degrees. So good point. Smith charts 180 degrees and uh, a polar chart is 360. Yeah, well, um, so if we're, let's see if I can pull up a CAD drawing here. Steve, I have a novice question. Can you describe yeah. to me physically what an input matching section of line looks like is? Yeah. I um, definitely can describe it. Um, oh, I had two turbo CAD start. There we go. Um, yeah, I'll answer that. It, it's a typically six feet of rigid transmission line at the input of the antenna. It could be inch and five eighths. It could be three and an eighth. It could be four and one sixteen. It could be six and an eighth depends on the antenna, um, but it gives us enough room to go one full rotation around the chart and then some. Um, and we use tip for FM, uh, worst case 88.1 in length. So we usually make that um, six feet um, to, to make it work for the whole FM band. Thank you. Yeah. So 180 degrees 
on the Smith chart and voltage is one for rotation. But a lot of times uh, in, in the Smith chart, if you zoom in, it's, it's referred to positive um, 180 or negative 180. Um, and uh, in polar too, it'll be negative 90 degrees or um, negative 180 and positive 180 are at the exact same point. But total degree movement, if you added all that up, one full rotation is 360 degrees. Um, and since I like to use uh, lambda per degree, so I just calculate my total degree movement and then multiply, um, that's my preference. That's what I like to do. Um, but we're you're right that one full rotation on the Smith is a uh, 100 and 80 degrees in voltage um, and in impedance is 360 degrees. Cool. Steve, I have a question. Eric yeah. in Phoenix. Hey. Hey there. Um, when you do these measurements, uh, so in our plant, which is typical for most of the FMs on South Mountain, you have transmitter, you have a three or four section bandpass filter, and then you have the transmission line going to the antenna. In our case, it's an older ERI BPF that's not really field tunable. Do you um, start your measurements on the transmitter side of the bandpass filter or the antenna side? The antenna side. Okay. Always. Yeah, so, uh, and that's, you know, again, my preference. I don't want the bandpass filter to distort my measurements of the antenna. So I like to tune the antenna, make that perfect, terminate the output of the bandpass filter, make that perfect, put the two together, take a final measurement. Yeah, uh, are there techniques to tune the older three section copper uh, ERI filters where no visible tuning nuts or other adjustments um, are visible? Um, well, I, I got to be something. I, I'm here. familiar with the ERI product, um, and I would I would I'd first talk, you know, verify with ERI. I'm not 100. percent What model is it? Do you know? I don't know offhand. I'm sorry, okay. I'm not at the office. So um, I don't want to speak for ERI, but from what I my experience with the ERI filters, um, they uh, the earlier cans use their loop couple and the I, I think that loop coupling uh, design and the loop coupling tool adjustment is was was used in the the older filter systems and they had a parallel capacitor which you would tune the probe with and that was just a um, it's just a very very simple plate capacitor on the side of the probe um, of course inside the cavity and to adjust that there's a nut on on the, I, on the side of the, each cavity and you would loosen that up with a wrench and an uh, Allen set and then you could tune each probe with that um, and then you tighten it down. Um, and then they, they did away with that parallel capacitor and changed the probe to, be, to have a bellow at the end so that you could tune each probe, uh, each, the length of each uh, uh, probe or radiator um, using the threaded rod adjustment. Um, so I, my understanding is the old ones, you can still tune them. They tune the, the same way, but just mechanically different. Um, and you can, you can tune those, my understanding. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Eric, I was just going to mention that um, even from some recent experience, I've, I've seen sort of issues with tuning a filter that's been in place for a while, that um, sometimes um, there is a, a, a lithium grease used internally, and uh, it can coagulate, and it becomes somewhat problematic to tune a, an older, retune an older filter. So it's, it's not necessarily maybe a slam dunk for reasons that might not be apparently obvious initially. Thank you, Steve. Interesting. I, uh, I, I admit I haven't taken the closest of a look at these filters. They've been in place for a long time. 
Um, we didn't have the funding when we rebuilt the tower to jump up to a four stage filter, which should get us better HD performance. So these are pretty old and I don't know what generation they are. I'll have to find out. I, I don't know if Steve's run into that at all when he's gone in. Uh, older filters, I'm sure you've had your hands in plenty, uh, whether or not mechanically there are, there are some issues that come over time. Any, any other questions? Uh, Steve, do you know how long that tape that holds the slugs in place will last? Or does that depend on if there's a forest fire in the area or what? <laughs> um, you know, it, it should last for the, the life of the antenna. Um, I haven't had it properly installed and the right tape is used then it hasn't, it ha I haven't seen one move other than when the, when an antenna has, has failed uh, over time at the end of the life of the antenna, maybe there's a burnout um, or some other event that has caused a lot of current or, or, or you know, the inner actually burning. That's when the, the tape, uh, I've seen it, um, you know, be damaged or deteriorate to the point where the, the slug has moved. But uh, under normal um, operations, I have I haven't ever seen the slug move uh, because of the the tape fill and then like that. And then there's there's collets that we can put above and below the uh, above and below the slug that can compress onto the inner and hold the slug in place. But those have a, a slight reactance uh, as well that that should be included in the measurement. Yeah, farther it's going to move is down to the next bullet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I got that going. Uh, <laughs> Steve Burt Weiner here again. Uh, I know we talked about this. You talked about this during the first session, uh, last yeah. uh, meeting you were at. But uh, I wanted to get uh, here again your opinion of stub tuning versus slug tuning, uh, the, the difference between them. Yeah, so both are are changing the impedance of their line at that point and correcting it. Um, the stub, um, the usually it's a, uh, a lot of times will be two if you want to be adjustable. Um, but stub tuning up on the tower would have to be, um, you know, it, it it would stick out to the side and would have to be weatherproof and it would have to be pressurized. Um, so the, it would be closer to an eighth wave. So if we did a quarter wave stub, we all know that's pretty much an open, uh, it is an, an open, um, in parallel, uh, short at the even harmonics, um, and an open at the fundamental and the odds. So the, that stub wouldn't do much for us, right? The quarter wave stub, but as we get as we approach an eighth wave stub, now we start to um, add some reactants in the line. And I, what's nice about maybe two eighth wave stubs right next to each other um, in the transmission system is you can adjust them. Uh, you can make an adjustable stub with it, um, but it's adding reactants in the line um, and you're putting that reactants in the proper location to correct it. Um, and if you make it adjustable, you can adjust both of them. You would, uh, one stub would be um, pushing the adding reactants uh, to make the next stub favorable for correcting. You can then make a, just a fixed location um, and have a fine matching network that you don't need to slug tune. You can just fine match, which is nice. Uh, there, there's, there's, 
uh, that, that's a great way of doing it. Um, I prefer the slug tuning because mechanically it's more simple and uh, less to fail. And so, you know, that's my thoughts on it. Um, but um, in any case, we're, we're adding reactants to the line to correct to the mismatch that the antenna has, um, usually due to it's on the tower. And now the uh, relationship between the, the antenna and the tower has affected the operating impedance, and we're we're correcting that with uh, with either a stub or or a slug um, or um, you know multiple Teflon uh, probes that uh, push through the the inner um, or a capacitor, um, you know, fine matching plate capacitors, uh, changing the capacitance from the outer to the inner. Um, all are doing uh, similar things to, to add reactants to the circuit to correct for the mismatch of the antenna. Hopefully that answers that. And it could be wrong. I could be wrong. <laughs> either the, either, what I always say is either that or I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but I was just curious, how often do you get into actual tuning of the antenna itself? And what's your, I, I know it can vary from so many different standpoints, but mm. what is your, your, do you have any suggestions of starting points on where you, when you tune the antenna itself rather than, you know, tuning the- Each element? Yeah. Oh, I got you. Um, I really don't like to do that on the tower unless we were doing a coarse frequency change. Um, I like to leave all the elements and some Manufactured antennas, you can adjust the caps. You can um, you can loosen up the caps. Uh, the, it's a cut cap that has a compression fitting. You can open it up. You can adjust the the feed point some. You can adjust the length of the the radiator. Um, my preference is to not touch that. Is to leave that all the same. And um, that way, usually from the factory, all the elements are set and they're similar in lengths, or at least they, sh they should be. And the feed points are all the same. I don't like changing that. I just like, usually if the antenna, antenna has changed because it's been mounted on the, the tower and, and that um, uh, has changed the input impedance, um, then I like to just correct at the input of the antenna uh, by, by matching the input of the antenna. That's my preference. That's my thoughts on it. Okay, thank you. You know, to, to have a little bit of a theoretical discussion on that, if you think about um, the purpose of the antenna is to um, couple the RF power into the ether. And uh, if an antenna is not at a resonant frequency, if, it's, if, if the antenna's impedance is not 50 ohms, then you're going to have a, a mismatch and the coupling isn't going to be great. The power is going to be reflected to the uh, transmitter, back to the transmitter. And so by using uh, some kind of impedance transformation at the, uh, at the input to the antenna, what you're trying to do is just maximize that coupling to the radiators. And um, the, the real rub comes in when the transmission, there's a lot of transmission line between the radiator because then you have the delay associated with the power being reflected to the transmitter, then being reflected back up to the antenna and back and forth. Yeah. Where if you do the impedance transformation right at the, right close to the radiating elements, there's no, um, there's no delay, so to speak. And Power might get reflected back to the transformer, but then it gets reflected back to the radiating elements. More of it is transmitted, so forth. So I think the real issue is when you try to tweak an antenna too far with impedance transformation, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Steve, is you can in, in, introduce some really large voltages at that transformer and yeah. cause that transformer to break down. And, and we see this sometimes when, um, an antenna that doesn't have radomes is subjected to icing, and all of a sudden the uh, <laughs> the matching section kind of uh, goes up and, and, and is defective simply because it can't deal with the transformation of, of the impedances. But mm -hmm. but I think 
clearly you don't want to have a situation where you've got such a bad um, match where it's not consistent throughout the 200 megahertz associated or 200 kilohertz associated with the transmitted frequency. Uh, but I, I think, you know, it's, it's really hard to tune an antenna on a tower to change the lengths of the uh, radiating elements to try to bring them back to a, yeah. 50 ohms. Yeah, it is. Um, I, and I've, you know, I've seen problems introduced where the, uh, that method was tried and you're looking at a parallel circuit, right? So if you're looking at a 12 bay antenna, you're trying to tune one bay at a time. Um, so the tower crew has to move the cap a little bit and you're only looking at, you're looking at the whole system in parallel and you're trying to make adjustments on one bay and you could, you know, grossly change the tuning of one bay and, and it's all in parallel and it's better. Um, but now you're coupling to each bay or element. Um, the ratio could be grossly off and cause failures uh, because of that. So I really, I, I don't like, unless it's a coarse tune and we're, we're doing something on the, uh, with the antenna where it's changing multiple channels and there's a process. I like to, uh, one, if, if we're doing that, bring the antenna down or, or just replace it um, yeah, and, and tune each bay so you know that each bay is tuned uh, to the same configuration or take measurements um, and physical measurements and move each bay to be the exact same. Uh, that would be another way of doing it, but yeah, you have to be really careful with that, uh, trying to tune each bay, especially on a multi-bay. If it's a one bay, that's a, you know, it's a lot easier to, to do. Um, but if it's a multi-bay antenna system, adjusting the, the elements and the feed points um, can, you know, it, it, it can get into a, a situation where you're uh, really throwing off the power distribution. Steve, two things. First of all, why don't you take this down and put your contact information back up? Okay. And then secondly, and this may be just the craziest question anyone's ever asked, AM transmitters all have a different phase point at their output. And you can take a station that sounds really good and make it sound really bad just by changing the transmitter. Suppose somebody changes their antenna. Is that likely to have a different effect similar to what I just said? Uh, for, for an FM antenna? For matching. Do different antenna manufacturers... I mean, th this shows a gap in my education, but do different antenna manufacturers have a different point of uh, matching that you have to be aware of, that you can't just swap out an antenna? Steve, you're welcome. Uh, Steve Marine, you're welcome to jump in too. Um, if we went from, you know, ERI to dielectric, would yeah. you swap the antenna or do you expect there to be a problem, an issue, a matching? I, I think every, every um, antenna install, there's, you know, that antenna system would likely need to be fine matched. Um, for for the new install, yeah, I, I think I think each new antenna system would, it, it, I mean, depending if you sweep the antenna and it's an acceptable good match, then you know don't 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 do any fine matching. But if um, you sweep the antenna and yeah, it, it needs a little touch up, then that's where the fine matcher comes into place and you you fine match the antenna. Um, I think every manufacturer, every new install. Um, deserves a measurement and make a decision on what needs to be done uh, once that install is complete. Steve, what do you think? Well, uh, I, th I actually think it's two different things going on, Barry. Um, the, the, the long wavelengths and associated with AM uh, kind of, I think it, it's a different situation in terms of the output phase you no, know, I, I fully appreciate that. I just, yeah. it was the first, 
instance that came to mind of how just changing one part of the system can create problems. And uh, again, I've, I've, I've had guys, I've had stations where <laughs> not to my advice, he was unhappy with the coverage. And so he had a tower crew out five times within several weeks to uh, rotate the antenna 10 or 15 degrees each time. And, each of those, of course, has its own effect. But I was just thinking from the standpoint of, of a uh, 98.1, just to use the, the number we're using today, antenna from two different manufacturers, would they present to the coax differently? I, 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 I think that the issue is um, on, on AM, it's, it's a whole different. Phenomenon. Of course. But, but on, on FM, Really, the really the issue is this: any antenna manufacturer provides an antenna that's designed to uh, provide a 50 ohm plus J zero load. What happens though is when you put that up against a tower, all of a sudden you get a lot more reactants. You've got a more metal structure, and so all those antennas wander some. And if it's a small antenna, uh, like for instance our DCRT or a 6812 from um, Shively or um, those antennas are not very broad. And so they're, they're not gonna accept the metal structure very well. They're gonna, they're gonna detune some. Um, but on a low power, you, you're not so concerned about the amount of power reflected back to the transmitter side as you are a high power antenna. So what Steve's saying is when you mount an antenna on a, on a metal structure, uh, it's no longer in free space and, it sh and the input impedance should be um, nominalized back to 50 ohms plus J zero. Uh, so that essentially, you, hopefully you've got symmetric bandwidth on that antenna and the maximum transfer of power into the antenna. But what, what, you, what you mentioned about the fact that do antennas sound differently, I know of a, I know of a situation in um, recent, in the last couple of years where a 20 year old antenna was replaced with a new antenna and the station engineer said, oh my gosh, I could hear the high frequencies that I couldn't hear on the old, on the, on the old antenna. I think, think to myself, how can an antenna be that narrow? But then he said, I, I was able to drop the subcarrier uh, or the injection uh, on the SCA significantly. Uh, and I no longer had any problems with my RDS. So, um, that was a case where an antenna probably made a huge difference in um, the, um, the, the audio quality on the transmitted signal. Uh, but it, it was, the old antenna was reflective of something that might've been acceptable maybe 20 or 30 years ago, but new antennas tend to be much broader and, and have much better performance characteristics. So I think definitely antennas can change sounds, the sound of a station, and if they're matched, I suspect they're all going to sound about the same if they're matched properly from a, from a audio fidelity perspective. What about impedance rotation at the power amplifier? Is this a significant problem in FM? Uh, what do you, what do you mean in terms of the, the, the number of uh, phase rotations, if you're... Uh, no, the phase rotation of the impedance at the power amplifier, uh, is it symmetrical reactance across the uh, bandwidth? Well, um, let me say this group delay can be a problem if you're going into a, a, a significantly tight filter and Steve might be able to speak more of this in terms of group delay. Uh, and of course, both Gates Air and Nautel now have the ability to correct for group delay on a transmission system, I think, so that you do have a symmetric bandwidth. But, but I don't think the absolute rotation of phase necessarily impacts anything. I mean, once again, Steve, maybe you have a sense of that. Um. On uh, solid state transmitters, I like you said, the, the group delay factor comes to mind. 
I've noticed um, when I was working with tube transmitters a lot that the loading of the output of the transmitter uh, is in series in most cases on an FM for like a, an 816R, that plate capacitor that goes from the output of the tube to the low pass filters in series. And that reactance, um, you can have more favorable phase angles that, uh, that that gives that plate capacitor that's in series, that loading capacitor, um, better reactance phase angles uh, that allows the transmitter to operate and tune better. So on a tube transmitter, especially an 816R, we probably all at times maybe struggled with tuning into uh, some type of reactance, um, like a bit, like a bandpass filter, something that narrows it up. We're not we're not um, perfectly um, centered up on our operating impedance, and um, by changing the length, the impedance phase angle we can get a more favorable phase angle at, that would land at that output capacitor. And it's, we can't really measure it, right? We, we can't, we'd have to take the capacitor off and measure at the low pass filter, it'd be some work. So usually what we do is we just put in a trombone section and then just adjust the line by, I recommend eighth wave increments and find that point where um, we're positive on the reactants or negative on the reactants so that, that that plate capacitor can tune through it. And uh, other transmitters have similar characteristics um, with their loading uh, tuning circuit, their output loading tuning circuit that will uh, uh, definitely allow you to have more tuning range at particular impedance phase angle. So that comes to mind. Um, with the, since solid state, we don't really have any tuning adjustments, um, then I guess that's probably not a factor in solid state a lot of times. I, I have found certain directional couplers and solid state transmitters, their directivity changes um, at um, the directivity changes as the impedance of the system changes. The, it's a balance, you know, to have good directivity at different impedance characteristics or slightly uh, less um, directivity characteristics and, and it doesn't change as much as the impedance characteristic of the line changes. So I have found that some directional couplers, um, their directivity changes enough that the voltage for the reflected power um, will increase at, di at different uh, line lengths. So to fix that, um, change some line length to try to decrease the voltage at the directional coupler so that the transmitter doesn't have uh, maybe quote false VSWR alarms or elevated VSWR. Uh, you can massage that some, I, I play with that. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Is, did we not used to say a quarter wavelength? Of transmission line between a tube transmitter and a and a reactive filter. What would you say, sir? I'm sorry. Did did we not talk about? Did we not talk about it? Didn't we used to put a quarter wavelength of transmission line between the transmitter and a and a bandpass filter to provide uh, isolation on a tube transmitter? Um, at least that um, that that quarter wave. Um, or some multiple. Yeah, um, I, I, what I've found uh, works for me, the installs is to put a trombone section in and find that, that um, length, that, uh, that length of transmission line where that, out, that impedance phase angle at the loading is favorable to tune through. That's my thought process with it. And, um, for um, you know what what I've done that, that's that's how I've handled it. Uh, but um, usually I've had probably more than a quarter wave, or um, I, I end up whatever needs to be favorable to make my termination, and then include a trombone section to fine adjust until I get uh, a transmitter that's that's stable. Um, 
and and not having tuning problems or spurry submissions uh, change that length and until my my loading's not pushed all the way to one side i can get near 50 percent on the loading and and uh, have a, a transmitter that can tune that's that's how i've handled them um, um but um, that's just been my experience <laughs> if you have a spectrum analyzer that you can look at your reflected sample mm -hmm. and the trombone you're at kind of the nth position because we're talking about getting a match at your carrier, but at your various harmonics, you could be looking into a bandpass filter that's a dead short at the fifth or seventh or ninth harmonic. And those things coming back at you can destabilize the PA of certainly a tube amplifier. Uh, I think in doing this, in going back to Barry's question, we're kind of asking two things at once. For the AM systems, the bandwidth of the AM is broad compared to the transmit frequency, and the response of a common point or even a single antenna is a lot more like transmitting power from a, your home stereo to a compound speaker. Um, it's not neat and symmetrical very often. It's always a resistive component. It's all you know. It's got a roller coaster reactive component. And especially when we started doing HD radio, at least they quantified this. The Rackleys and Ben Dawson's said, you know, this is what you can tune it to. And I've used those numbers even on mono systems that would never be digital. It just, things that had been uh, um, seat of your pants stuff in the old days, you put in the transmitter and you change it and Gee, it just sounds different. The PD is unhappy or the PD loves it, but you can't quantify why it got better. And with HD, we kind of, once we had network analyzers, we could really define that a lot better. For FM, you're at 100 times higher frequency, and the bandwidth is about a fifth of what you need relative to the frequency. So I would expect the antenna to make less difference. It's Ripley. But within the bandpass you need, it's it's closer to, to I won't say flat, I'll say closer to nominal is my thought. I, I think from the TV side, antenna manufacturers always talk about percentage of bandwidth. And it's much easier to get the six megahertz in the UHF band than it is to get the six megahertz in the uh, in the in the low band VHF, and prob and probably uh, the same goes. It, it's harder to get the necessary bandwidth on AM because of the low frequency. The percentage of bandwidth that you need to be relatively flat is so much higher. So I I, I totally agree with you, Dave. That that's a lot the case. Okay, well. Steve, we're, we're going to let, actually both of you, Steve's, we're going to let Steve off the uh, hotspot for the moment. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. We want to invite you back. I have some other topics dealing with uh, antennas and tower crews and things like that I'd like to ask you. Uh, and we may do some this afternoon, but uh, certainly want to invite you back. Thank you, Barry.